So hi, everybody. As you join the webinar, just let us know where, that, where am I now um, today. I'll just get out of the way a little bit. I am in the library at the University of Virginia. Um, I worked at UVA from, is it 81 to 83 before I went to University of Kentucky to grad school. Um, I didn't spend any time in this library. I was too busy spending my time in the biology department where I was working. All right, so we'll just wait a minute while people join. Um, last year, you'll see the participant number at the bottom there kind of lets us know where we're at. Um, and Lester, if you're okay with it, um, I might put some of this up as Facebook Live. Is that okay with you? I'm okay with that. Okay, great. Um, I, I, I'll see if I can, sometimes I technologically have a problem with that, but we may roll with that. We'll see what happens. All right, we'll just give it another minute. Um, sounds like the sounds good. I, I have some regulars, in fact. Um, it's really fun to see the people that are the regulars on uh, on the webinars, and they they've been pretty dedicated to uh, to being here with me. Um, so it's great. All right. So I think we'll go ahead and get rolling. I'll just do a brief intro, uh, Lester, and then we'll go from there. Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and I've been bringing you a series of webinars during the pandemic. Uh, it's been my honor and pleasure to have some amazing guests on my webinars, and I'm, it's just been so fantastic, and the information has been really great. Uh, I'm going to keep rolling with these through the month of June because I've decided to stay home through June. Um, in July, I'm hoping I can travel, but I'm only going to do some driving clinics. And at the same time, I'm going to see if I can't keep the webinars going, maybe not quite at the frequency I've been doing right now. Um, you can find all of the webinars on my YouTube channel, Surefoot Equine, and we post them up on the Facebook page. So um, if you have any friends you want to tell about the webinars, just send them over to the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. Today, my guest is Lester Buckley. Uh, he's a horseman that I met. Lester, when did we meet? About five years ago? Um, I think it was no, about five years ago, maybe longer. I hate to think about it. Um, it was like eight. We were living in Hawaii. Right. How long ago was that? It was seven to eight years ago. Oh, okay. Longer ago than I thought. Um, a good friend of mine, a neighbor, Nancy, uh, had met Lester when she traveled out to California. And so she was so impressed with his work, she decided to bring him to Virginia to do workshops and clinics. Well, of course, I was traveling most of the time. And when Lester came, he came from Hawaii and he needed a horse. So I had him come over to meet Al before I'd let him ride my horse. Um, Lester had back pain and we'll talk about that in a little while, but he had some back pain. And so uh, we did some stuff. Uh, he wound up with a big red ball and he'll, we'll let him tell the rest of that story. Um, so I've known Lester since that time, although you know, like so many of my friends, we don't get to see each other very often because we're usually traveling in different directions. Um, but we always kind of stay in touch, which is one of the things that I think a true friendship really shows is that you don't have to be around people to stay friends with them and you can reconnect anytime. So uh, thank you for coming, Lester, for being on the webinar. Glad to be here, Wendy. Glad to help share what you're doing. That's great. So Lester, um, some people may not know who you are. So if you could give us your, your kind of history, bio, background, how you got here. Um, I think it's a fascinating story and I think it's inspirational for a lot of people. So if you wouldn't mind sharing a bit of that, I think it would be great. Okay, I'll keep it, I'll keep it real brief. Uh, I was raised in Texas. I lost my mom and dad pretty early and the horses became a bit of a sanctuary there for me. And I went to college in a little school, Alpine, Sol Ross State University. And I got a scholarship to go, kind of the ultimate scholarship. I got a scholarship to go follow Ray Hunt around and uh, see what he was teaching and then come back and teach it to my peers there at the university. And graduated with a Bachelor of Science in, in Range Animal Science and apprenticed after that with a cutting horse trainer, a good one. Uh, Willie Richardson for about seven years and then he basically told me he didn't have any more to teach me that I should go create my own life. So from there I spent a little bit of time in Canada and I trained horses at the King Ranch. King Ranch introduced me to the Parker Ranch and those were really key years for me because I had the principles that Ray and the other horsemen had laid down but I needed time to sort it out and practice and so between Canada 
and the King Ranch and the Parker Ranch, you know, we would get to start a hundred colts or more a year and obviously make some mistakes and, and maybe not all of our judgment was great, but in retrospect, you have good judgment uh, through experience and, and uh, kind of grew up in the cutting horse business. Uh, and when I was just about ready to kind of segue out of that sport, uh, I met a, a fellow named Hannes Mueller was teaching a dressage training clinic there in Fort Worth while I was showing cutting horses. And I got invited to sit in between classes and I didn't know who he was, but I remember the writing was absolutely gorgeous. And so I took notes every day and I've still got my notes to this day that I refer to. And after about a week, he and I became friends and he invited me to come to Germany and ride. And so I went to Germany and rode as part of a pilot program where they took non-German riders and shared with them the principles of dressage riding, uh, sport jumping and, and their cross country and then became an instructor licensed through the German FN uh, in that sport as well. And now Mary and I live here in Kentucky. We have our home and our own horse farm here. And we just, uh, you know, we'll bring in a few horses from time to time that are, that are special. And then of course we travel when, when it's permitted, uh, you know, through life circumstances to travel and teach and, and help people with their horses wherever they live. And in a nutshell, uh, I use the term loosely. That's kind of my story. Yeah. So um, when we met, you were still living in um, Hawaii, right? Yes, ma'am. And, um, yes. and, and you had back pain. So t tell us a little bit about that. Because, you know, otherwise I'm going to talk about red and people are going to wonder what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kind of our mutual joke now is when Wendy sends me an email or a letter, she'll say, How's, how are you and Red getting along? Uh, and basically, Red is this big red ball. And so the lady, Nancy, who organized my Virginia clinic, wanted me to demo. And then, of course, Wendy had the horse, Al. And Wendy, she's like, well, you can't get on my horse till you get balanced. And uh, so I bet we spent four to five hours in Joyce's barn. Yeah on the ball, not on, just on the ball, but just on watching me move and watching, and, and, and it really, I had historic back problem all the way from high school, from an injury, till I met you, which is a long, several decades, and it was chronic, and I saw the chiropractors regularly. And what I appreciate about your teaching is you didn't say, that's wrong, do this. You just said, let's try this, what do you think about that? Let's try this, what do you think about that? And so it's almost like you kind of in that barn for four or five hours, you kind of led me to learn how my own body felt better. And the ball was just kind of like, it still is. I mean, it's in my tack room to this day, uh, a way for me to go back and without trying to force an exercise to allow my body to, to stretch and find its, find its own best balance again. And, and, I'm so thankful now maybe we see the chiropractor less than once a year oh, and wow. when things are kind of starting to get a little bit tight I, I know you basically you were able to share with me some key exercises that I can run in there and just close the doors and then Red and I have a nice little visit <laughs> for however long it is and then <laughs> and then I come out and then I'm like reset so to speak and and rebalanced and and i've kind of got rid of the tension that was starting to creep in and then i'm ready to go right again so uh yeah that was that was and you know you kind of kicked that deal off that four to five hour session there in joyce's barn but it it gave me the tools to, to basically use it you know for the rest of my life that's so awesome because i um I remember working with you, but then again, we went our separate ways and I had no idea that Red was traveling with you as much as he was. And because uh, Lester named the ball Red. And, um, and it, it's just Red. really great because, you know, that's the whole basis of the Feldenkrais method, which is a lot of what we did, is that we can become our own teachers and we can heal ourselves. And um, I, it just makes me smile to know how, that you're, you know, you're able to do that for yourself now. That is so cool. Really, really fun. So um, during that time, when Le oh, go ahead, Lester. And then after that, I passed the test. The one statement that's hilarious is uh, you were looking at me and you go, you're walking like an old man. And I'm like, 
I know that's what it feels like. You're like, well, if you want to be an old man, walk like an old man. I said, I don't want to be an old man. <laughs> and so you said, well, here, let's walk like your age or younger. And and then I began walking like that. And wow, did it help. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yes. And so then with that, then I got to write Al and then the rest is history. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. That was really fun. And, you know, so often too is, and that's one of the things about um, doing this as a profession it's hard work. It's a lot of physical work. We ride a lot of horses. Maybe a horse doesn't, you know, twist funny and kind of throws us out. And if we don't have ways to reset our own body and, and get rid of whatever that is that happened to us, that injury, that pattern, that stiffness, we carry that onto the next horse. And so then each horse we get on, we carry a little bit of that too. And, and that it's going to affect the training. So, um, you know, it's really important. I, I had another guy who was from Spain and he was a trainer from Spain. He rode in the school in Jerez. And, um, you know, the first Feldenkrais lesson I gave him, he said, I said, do you have any, any pain anywhere? He says, I'm a rider. And I'm like, yeah, okay. So do you have, oh yeah, my back. And so I gave him a lesson. And then a couple months later, I saw him again and, I, and he said, I'm a rider. And I was like, okay. And we gave him another lesson. And the third time he said, I sit at a desk. <laughs> and so his riding had gotten so much better. But now it was the desk that he realized was causing him problems. So, um, yeah, sometimes we get stuck in these patterns and think that's what we have to live with. But um, that's where the Feldenkrais method shows us that we can achieve our potential and we don't have to feel limited by the injuries that we've had in the past. So that's just, I'm just really, um, it tickles me to, to know that you're doing well. It really does. Um, so today, um, Lester, uh, uh, has he sent me a bunch of pictures uh, about a horse that he worked with so so after we met I was doing surefoot I started surefoot about eight years ago actually it was eight years ago May in 2012 so Lester I I probably what didn't even show that to you at the time because either I hadn't started or I had just started um, but when you came back I did and um, worked with Nancy's horses with the pads and then tell us how because I don't I you moved from Hawaii what year 2015. 15. Yeah, so I know that that was a that was a pretty big move to go from Hawaii to to Kentucky, um, weather-wise as well as just geographic location. Um, so we kind of lost touch a little bit, but then later on you came back and um, to work with Nancy's horses and um, and I'm not sure where in that process you uh, we talked about Surefoot. I can't remember now. Maybe you remember. Oh, I, I remember like it was yesterday. Okay. Uh, first, we all had supper one night, and you and Joyce were sitting right next to me, and you were talking about Surefoot, and you were like, I think I'm onto something, but, you know, and so it was kind of the genesis of watching you guys talk about it, and then I said, bring them to the clinic, and so after the clinic, you put out all these pads, and you had me step on them, oh. and you're like, okay, just, and, <laughs> and you said, I don't care how you step on them or how long you stay on them, but just start with whichever foot you want and make a circle and then come back. Then you'll come off of them. And I think there was a series of four. There okay. was a wedge and a big flat one and a kind of medium round one. And anyway, there was four different variations and you had me step on them myself, no right or wrong, and then come around and then do it again and do it again. And we, we, we watched my balance and poise start to advance as I did this myself. And that was my introduction. Oh, wow, I'm glad you remember. I totally forgot that. But as you say that, it's coming back to me. I think that was over at, um, at that farm where, um, oh, I can't remember her name. Cabin yeah. Creek. That's it, Cabin Creek. It was yep. over at Cabin yeah. Creek, yeah. Oh, uh, cool. It was. Yeah, and so then, um, Later on, sort of the next time I recall that we talked about it was that you had a client that brought her horse to you for training. Is that right? That's correct. I, I came across the horse actually in a clinic in California. We had moved to Kentucky, brought all, all of our horses from Hawaii, and we were teaching the clinic in California. And there was a horse there that was kind of surly and real bothered and uh, not having a great day, a little bit cranky. And uh, and the rider is a very good rider, but they're, for whatever reason, we just couldn't figure out what was going on. And at any time she'd ask the horse, I mean, any time and all time, she'd ask the horse to go, he would just rear up 
uh, considerably rare up to the point that any intelligent rider would take their legs off and and uh we just is during the clinic we tried working with him there for a little bit and the rider the trainer finally stepped off and said that's it i'm done uh, I, I just i'm done with him and so we put the horse away and we went on with the clinic for a couple of days and then the owner of the horse asked if i would come by the private barn and we kind of tried some little things uh with him there in california and he was still holding on to a lot of stuff and so uh, that trainer was okay with that horse you know kind of passing out of her season and the owner asked if i would be interested in bringing him back to kentucky and so we brought him back to kentucky and and um, we've had him some time now and that first year really was a bit of a challenge because he was doing the same behavior with me i'd ask him to uh maybe move his hip or just take a step and i mean not really much at all and then he was real you know kind of a little bit sour and unsettled and if you ask him to do much he would rear and uh and that's where your sure foots came in and so we spent a little bit of time well actually quite a bit of time just letting him know that he could trust my legs trust my core and then i worked out a relationship with him to where he would learn to trust my hands so i'd like to show uh, the picture that you sent me of, of when he arrived okay mary mary said he was that. a little bit depressed i would say okay he was he i wouldn't say he was a joyful horse when he arrived and i i think this is the one can you see that yep yeah yes so, i can see that it's not large or anything but he was, uh, you know, he was relatively depressed, uh, and, and you know, didn't he certainly he certainly wasn't thriving. And how old was he here, Lester? That's a good question. You know, he might have been just kind of entering his prime years, maybe uh, seven years old, maybe six. And did you ever get a history uh, on him? Maybe six. Yeah, yeah, the wonderful, beautiful owners, and they had raised him, and he had a wonderful childhood, so to speak. Um, and, uh, you know, they'd kind of maintained him, and it had a good start. He just kind of got into a season where he lost his confidence in his movement and maybe his confidence in people and uh, kind of needed a different season, you know, to, to one of those exceptionally intelligent kind of horses that we really have to ride in a real fair way and when it's not fair he's the kind that's go hey, hey wait a minute here no oh. yeah i think this is another picture yeah. of him when he arrived yep that's when he came i think wow. that's like just the first couple of days when he got here and just kind of you know we try to bring up the joy and the brilliance in the horses when they come in for training and obviously develop them physically as well and uh he was he was just what I would call just kind of flat and maybe a little bit more internal and didn't really have a lot of interest in, well, he just didn't express joy for living. And so, you know, it's interesting because, you know, usually we associate those horses with horses that have been abused or, you know, have had a traumatic experience. Um, and this one, you know, basically that's just kind of was him. Yeah, no, he didn't, I don't, to my knowledge, he didn't have any trauma or no bad experiences. He just kind of went through a season where he lost his joy of movement, really. And we know that movement with horses is a huge thing. Yeah. Having confidence to move freely. And he had lost that. Yep. And I think this is one more picture here of when he arrived. Yep. Yep. And so you can and see he doesn't look stressed i mean he's he looks fairly relaxed there even though he's traveled to your place yeah he's he's relaxed he's not worried he's not trying to get away or anything but he's just you can tell he's just kind of inside of himself and not really uh that interested in and in what's going on on the outside and he's really different than that now yeah so um, one of the things that I, that I forgot to kind of talk to you a little bit about is that uh, because you went to Germany, you, you ride both Western and English. 
Um, you're not afraid I'm to put on, a, put on a pair of britches, in other words. I'm not afraid of that. Yep. No. <laughs> and, um, and so you, how long did you spend in Germany? We went back and forth for almost a decade. So oh, wow. all of their program, all, all of their programs would be anywhere from a month to about six weeks, depending on what level that you were writing at. And that's, you know, uh, and of course they don't specialize whether it's in horses or people, you have to do all the events. So you would always have a uh, lunging and your basis, you know, in your barn management and then dressage, uh, sport jumping and uh, cross country and then you would have your theory and you in your theory basically you needed to learn the German uh, philosophy of training and the training scale and and so over a period of 10 years we would go uh, pretty regularly and it would be for anywhere from a window of four to six weeks depending on the sessions they were having. Did you learn German? You know it's a weird question. Uh, <laughs> the the breeders there that i work with now number one the germans they they're really wanting to speak english when you go uh so i had a heart surgery the year i was supposed to go for my trainer's license test and i had a heart surgery my first heart surgery in my 40s and so i missed going with the americans and so later i got to take the riding uh trainer's license test with the germans and it was a blast because they were all just dying to speak english <laughs> Uh, so what I learned was I can hear it and I can understand what they're saying and then I'll speak back to them in English oh, okay. and then they'll speak back to me in German and it's 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 really an odd conversation because I'll speak to them in English and they'll answer me in German and I'll speak to them in English and they'll answer me in German and it's like we understand each other. You know, uh, I did try to learn, I'm sorry, I did try to learn German and I learned just enough to get me in trouble. And I went into a restaurant or somewhere and I spoke to German that I knew and then they thought I knew more and then they started speaking really fast and I'm like, wait, time out. I don't know any German. Forget it. <laughs> it's not an easy language. I tried to learn it and I've, I've gone to Germany. I can't tell you how many times. Um, and unfortunately, I, you know, I am not language gifted. So that's always one of my thoughts when I go to a country is, will I, you know, if they speak English, I'm okay. But if they don't speak English, I'm really in trouble i have to have a translator but um but the reason yeah. i wanted to bring up that you've written english is because one of the photos here that um mary sent mary's your wife mary sent me was that you started him treasure under saddle under english saddle so i've got that picture blown up can you see that okay i can see it small but yeah that was that was our beginning and uh the you know the owners they were hopeful they were hopeful that he could just be a, a classic English dressage horse. And here I've just got an old passier on him and we're starting out and, and, and he held on to a little bit of stuff. And there I'm just making sure that everything fits properly. I don't, w w wasn't looking for the Tom Mix look there. So. Uh, well, that's the thing is if you've so gone to the German schools, then d detail and exactness is really important. <laughs> um, and I'm sure that that carries yeah. over in everything you do. Yes, detail. Yeah. <laughs> and so how um, did you, you started him under English tack then? Yes, ma'am. Uh, and I just felt like I needed to keep trying things to get him refreshed. So we did the English tack for a season and uh, he was okay, but it's like he still kind of held on to quite a bit. And so I talked with the owners and they're real gracious people. And I said, do you mind if I ride him Western? There he is, English again. This is in our outdoor arena, obviously during winter time. And you can see now he's starting to get a little bit of joy by now. I probably have tested the uh, surefoot on him by now. I can see by the look in his face. And, uh, but that's winter time in our outdoor arena. The other one was winter time in our indoor arena. Now this is a dressage saddle. The other was more of a uh, uh, jumping saddle. And so, you know, we took him over the ground poles, kind of anything to get their mind off of me onto the job at hand. So the other little posse saddle was, you know, going over some ground poles. And, you know, we use uh, Linda's uh, labyrinth that she has. Oh, yeah. And different things like that. And this is actually his own dressage saddle that I was riding him with. And 
as time went on, you know, we just started to find other ways to refresh him. Yeah, and I'm sure you wrote him out because there's beautiful countryside all around you. Especially in the wintertime because there's fewer bugs. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, <laughs> ab ab about how long had he been with you at that point? That's probably all within his first year right there. Oh, okay. And then... Yeah. His ears are up and he's looking pretty happy right there. So he's probably, he's probably hit the year point at that point, at least. Maybe even after that. And so you started using the Surefoot pads with him pretty early on, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, because we were just looking for options to basically to get him to kind of turn loose of some of that maybe some of the memories or even the way of moving and and what my gut instinct was is a little bit like what you and i experienced in the hallway as i started to move freer and with my true balance then i started to feel wonderful and then my joy came and then i'm trying to offer that same kind of feeling that i got to him and so the surefoot pads came in there and we have a lot i remember i had mary come up to the arena and i was just gonna like hop on him saddle him slide four pads because we'd already done it in the barn aisle so he was familiar with the pads and i said hey just grab your cell phone let's video this it shouldn't take too long let's just slip the four pads under his four feet i'm just gonna sit on him here for however long he decides it's gonna be and then when we're done i'll just ride him off and we'll marry the two things together and so we started filming and filming and filming. And I'm not kidding, Wendy, he like went to sleep. And it started like this. First he closed his eyes. And it's matter of fact, we like ran out of battery, ran out of film capacity. <laughs> so I'm sitting on him and, and he closed his eyes and then he started doing this. Oh, the with his body. Yeah. And I'm like, wow. I said, I'm just going to go with him. He's not coming off the pads. His eyes aren't even open. And this must have gone on for 20 minutes. Wow. And then after about 20 minutes, he kind of got a little bit quieter. And then he stopped and he just kind of blinked his eyes a little bit. And then he opened his eyes like, wow, that was a great nap. I don't know what all was going on. And he blinked his eyes a little bit. And then he got bright and he put his ears up and he just nonchalantly stepped off of the sure pads and we walked and it was a wonderful walk just what I was hoping for and then he walked and then we just asked for a free walk and then from free walk I said would you and I just brought the life up I didn't put a lot of leg on him or anything I just brought my life on it's like how about a how about a trot and then he offered me a trot and then we're trotting and his ears were up and he's joyful and I said how about a canter and off we went and I just let him lope and I got up and rubbed on him and we just cantered around as long as he wanted to go. And then when he was done, took a little break, went the other way, loped both directions, got off, uncinched him, put him in the barn. And it was like a big turning point. Uh, it was a big turning point for him and me both in our relationship, I would say. Wow, that is amazing. That's just a, you know, I, I, I've been doing this for eight years, okay? But I still get so joyful when I hear these stories about these horses that, um, find themselves or come out of whatever they're stuck in and and get back to movement and joy and that just gives me chills that's a, such a such a great story to hear so delightful thank you and so you've continued on and so now i have some after pictures uh, of uh, his name is treasure right i'm just i realized i treasure it. yes he's treasure yep treasure's his name and we found that he was actually good at different things and it wasn't just uh you know what we had in mind our agenda for him we kind of turned loose of our agenda for him and we started riding him doing some western dressage work with him and then uh, taking him to i don't show a lot uh, but this particular horse i've taken to just a handful of shows and uh, he's done so here he is at the kentucky horse park and a uh, beautiful trot and this is in an arabian uh ranch class is what this is so you know he's ridden one-handed now western saddle and you know there's people around judges uh and he's enjoying life wow that's such a great picture and and so um how long has he been with you now because he's still with you right about 
three to four years, I think. He's still with us. Yes, this is this is pretty much home for Treasure. Yep. Yeah. And so yeah, he, um, he has found it. So I was just going to ask, like, like, okay, so he came to you, and it was about a year before he kind of, kind of, you had. When did you have that experience? I'm just trying to think of a timeline because some people wonder, you know how long does this take or when am I going to see a change or you know that kind of a question and and obviously one of the things is that your good training goes along with using the surefoot pads to make these changes it's not just the pads that's causing a miracle here it's the combination of the pads and good training that's a key point uh, part of it is I had to develop a relationship with him so that he trusted my hands but for him to trust my hands, I had to have trustworthy hands, because if I didn't have trustworthy hands, that would overrule anything else. Uh, and then I had to have trustworthy legs. And so once he understood that there was a certain fairness about the more he imported, you know, the more he did in his body, the less I would do. And so here he is, I'm just doing a little bit and I've kind of got my seat forward and we're flying around the arena on loose rain. But uh, timeline, we're at, you know, you can see he's quite a bit more light colored here yeah. than the dappling that he had when he came. So we're looking at probably two and a half to three years here. Uh, and it was, it was a combination of getting him confident in my hands, getting him confident in my seat, letting him learn to how to be in harmony with my body, getting him confident in my legs, and then getting confident at home and then taking it to little venues to where he could he could uh you know handle the the stimulus of the environment so the whole process to get him to that point right there was probably a three-year process at least and uh, but it, you know worth every moment and uh and now we use them for maintenance and we don't have those long you know 20 minute 30 minute sessions anymore being on the pads uh, if it's kind of a cold, drizzly day, or he just needs, maybe he's not moving the way, you know, that I know he can, we'll just put him on the pads in the middle of the barn aisle, and then kind of let him determine how long he wants to be on them. Uh, so this is Treasure there at the Kentucky Horse Park, and this is uh, Western Ranch class. And, uh, and then at the same time, we were showing him in Western Dressage uh, the same days. So he would go show in Western dressage, but you can see that's a happy horse right there. Yeah, absolutely. Very proud of himself, it looks like. <laughs> yes. So yes. that experience that when you were sitting on him and, and he was swaying, what, how long was that after you got him? Like, I'm just trying to kind of figure out when that moment happened. But, pardon? Um, the the time when you early. were on him and you and he swayed when you ran out of camera battery. When what? Where was that in the timeline? That was within the first year. That's when we were still being real creative to kind of you know pull out everything that we could to get him joyful. Uh, so that was within the first year. It wasn't probably within the first six months, but I'd say between that six month year window. You know, by then we started riding him Wester and I was taking him outside more. I found, you know, he was a little bit more excited. Oh, there he is. And we're, we're both hot and sweaty right there. Yeah. That because... is in uh, July. Yeah, it's go ahead. high humidity. And uh, super high humidity. That's at the Kentucky Horse Park. And right there, he was, uh, he won his class in his division in the Arabian Western Trail class. And then he ended up reserve champion overall for our region and uh and i'm happy i'm proud of him he's proud of himself and i don't think there's a dry thread on either one of us that's no kentucky, kentucky in july, in july <laughs> i just can't imagine showing in the middle of the day <laughs> but you know that's the great thing about the arabians i mean he's like yeah it's hot but let's go do it and you can still see after really being taxed uh, so that's warmed up for two different classes and competing in two different classes. And then he's still like, life is good. Yeah. And your back looks really nice and soft there, Lester. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Wendy. I appreciate that. I, uh, it's, it's an ongoing project, but I have, I have some help now. Yeah. Um, it looks like we might Matter have fact, a this, this is a little 
Oh, okay. Now, there's, somebody's just this making a, a comment that they love that you talk about the importance of bringing joy back to the horse. And, and I think that that is something that's, that's really important and that, um, you know, I'm not sure that we talk about that enough. We think about performance and we think about training. And, you know, one of the things that I've noticed with my students um, is that they get so caught up in right and wrong and, and they have to get it right that they forget about the process of learning and that it's messy. It's not always a, you know, a simple thing. It's not a straight line. It's not always a great experience. It's messy. And that's kind of what learning is like, but we always have to keep uh, in mind. I think for me, we have to keep in mind, why are we here? Why are we doing this? We're doing this because it's something we love. And the minute we start to make it something that has all these rules and all these, you know, restrictions, then we lose that. We lose that joy too. Yeah. I think you see it in other places in nature as well, Wendy. Uh, like the trees, you know, Kentucky's blessed with an abundance of trees. But I know when the weather is just all peaceful and easy, the roots really aren't going down. But when the storms come and they're blowing on those trees and, you know, and it's, 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 it's messy, you know, the storms are coming and hopefully it doesn't, you know, break a tree or kill a tree. But what happens as a result of those storms is the trees are like, oh my, I better put down a little bit more root. And that's why we end up with these big, beautiful elms and walnuts and sycamore trees that we have. Yeah. Those, those messy days, or those, those strained days, I should say, put down roots. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was talking to um, Stephen Peters. You know Dr. Stephen Peters. And, um, yes, you know, we st we're talking about resilience in horses and resilience in people, that you're able to process and take in information and make something out of it as opposed to having it be a threat or being af afraid that when we're resilient, we can look at something, evaluate it, assess it, and integrate it into our world in terms of that we're safe and we don't have to react to this thing. We can just um, choose the action that we want to take. Okay, I'm going to write that down. <laughs> yes. No, that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. And I'm working on myself. <laughs> exactly. And so to be resilient, we can't, we can't be taught in fear if we're going to be resilient. Mm -hmm. When we're taught in fear, we're, we're not able, we're not actually learning. We're just tolerating things and we're not making good associations. We're actually making disassociations. In other words, we can't look at one thing and look at another and recognize, oh, that's similar. Like this is a pen, this is a pen, even though they look totally different, they're both pens, I can write with them. When we dissociate like that because we're learning in fear, we can't do that. Horses can't do that and humans can't do that. They're separate things and then we're to our world is so disturbed by them. That's a good point. Yeah, and, it, and, um, and I got a picture here of, I can't find the video just yet, but I'm, I know I downloaded it. Oh no, this is the video. So, so this is Treasure on some soft pads. And we'll just, let me just pull this back and we'll play this little video. And this would be what we would consider maintenance for him. And so how often does he, roughly, I mean, I know it's kind of depending on the day, but like how often would you say on average you uh, he stands on pads? You know, maybe once every six weeks. I mean, you know, it might be a month and then he might go two months. As long as he's moving well and he's happy, then I don't use the pads. But if he goes through a little season and he's kind of struggling, we get him out. And, and it seems like the longer we've gone, the longer he'll stand on them. Because if I bring him out and use them too quickly after we've used them before, he's like, no, no, I don't want to stand on those, you know. And then he just walks off. Yeah. And so it's kind of like we have to wait until he says that, you know, some things aren't quite right. And then we let him stand on them. And then he's like. Ah, yeah. So, and sometimes we'll go several months at a time and not feel the need for them. And so it's more just a kind of a gut instinct. Yep. And one of the things you can see here, if I'm just going to play the video really slowly, is that breathing change right there. If you watch here in his lower ribs, you can really see how he takes this really deep breath right there. And you see the whole rib cage expand. That's really awesome. And you and, can, go ahead. You can hear it all audio you'll hear him just breathing shallow and then you'll hear a hey I, I put the sound on 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, hear it? Yeah, that was great. Takes a nice deep breath. <laughs> yep. And so, you know, this is one of the things that, that um, it, you've done a really nice job of explaining it. It's like people say, well, how often should my horse be on the pads? And it's, it's so variable. I mean, I've had people come up to me and say, you know, my horse wants a hard pad under the right front foot every single day that, I, you know, when I groom my horse, not the left, only the right every single day. And then there's other horses like Treasure that once they've had the sort of the learning process of it, then you go into the maintenance mode where it's, you know, every week or every couple of weeks or every six weeks. And it's, it's just, it's not something that you can write a formula for. No. We're all individuals. Yeah. Have, have you used the pads with other horses in your barn? Mm hmm Yep. We, I have a trainer that has a group of clients, and they come over up until the COVID deal. They come over once a month, and she has a Connemara Lusitano uh, cross, and same kind of deal for him. Uh, he's a very cautious horse with a tremendous amount of talent, mm -hmm. and last time she was over here, she was like, Hey, you know what? Let's let him stand on the pads and he'll tell us if he likes it or not. And uh, he's an extremely talented horse and she's an extremely talented trainer. But, you know, we took him out into the indoor arena and I think it was in the wintertime even. And we slipped him underneath there. Yeah, that's him. And he just, he hung out there for quite some time. And he, you can tell he's enjoying life right there, just kind of hanging out on the pads. Yeah. And uh, so she's a fellow trainer. This is here at our indoor, but she's a fellow trainer and, and uh, you know, quite talented herself. And this horse really didn't have problems. We were just looking at improving his way of going. But I like the twinkle in his eye there and his ears. And obviously we're way back. We're, matter of fact, we're sitting down in chairs <laughs> on the side of the arena, her, her and her clients, and he's standing out there by himself. He's like, no, I'm good, really. You don't have to come out here and babysit me at all. It's not like we just stepped back and said, quick, get a picture. It's like we actually went and sat down in chairs. Yeah. You know, I have one client, and what she does is brings her horse into the arena and puts the horse on pads and then goes and sets all of her jumps. And when she goes back to her horse, <laughs> if the horse isn't ready, she won't get off the pads and she has to wait. And then when she's ready, she gets off and she gets on and then rides her horse. So, um, you know, it's really, it's so fun to see when the horses get to have the option. And I, that's one of the things for me that's, that's the most important is that we offer these horses a choice and we give them a voice and let them show us what is important to them. Amen. Yeah. And, and, and it kind of helps us develop an attitude of listening to them because ultimately they have the answer. And we're here to say, let's try this together. Yeah. And then they'll be like, yeah, this works. Or like, oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's such a different thing than thinking that we have to have all the answers. You know, I think that's one of the, one of the things is that you know, we think, oh, I've got to have the answer. And so I, even if I don't have it, I'm going to kind of try and make something happen because I'm supposed to be the one leading this thing. Um, and, and that's where we get into some of the training philosophy that's really, um, instead of a communication or a partnership, it's more of a demand and a telling, but we lose a certain quality of relationship. And for me, the thing that's most important is that if I make a mistake, I want my horse to take care of me and make a good decision in spite of my errors. And especially, you know that when you're jumping or going cross country or fox hunting, it's really important that the horse is able to take care of himself and look out for you as opposed to, you know, thinking that you have to tell him what to do all the time. Because there's so many times you're gonna make a mistake or not know the terrain or they're gonna see something or know a better idea. Um, and so it's, it's, sometimes it's hard for people, especially people that spend a lot of time in the arena to um, kind of let go of that sort of, I'm supposed to know better thing and allow the horse to show us what they know or what they're curious about. I, I agree. And I think part of that, you know, I wished we could have wisdom when we were young and humility when we were young, but sometimes we don't, right? We have hormones and all these other things and maybe we don't know that much, but we think we do. And, 
and but as we get a little bit older and we have a little more and 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 those older trainers they would offer us that advice they'd say well you know you might just want to slow down and and you might want to learn to listen but but you know in essence kind of what we're saying is it's a beautiful thing to be to be able to have enough humility to know that nobody knows as much about that horse as the horse does mm -hmm. and he's willing to teach us if we have a kind of a spirit of humility to where we can listen to him and we don't have all the answers but uh but if we have that kind of spirit about us then he can he can say this this is helpful this works this causes me confusion and i think that's where we develop that harmony where when we struggle they're like it's okay lester i got this you know <laughs> you catch up because i know you will <laughs> and then when i catch up he's like i knew you'd come back but to get that there had to be some season of harmony where we were together and that's why the hands, the legs, the core, the breathing and all that had to sync up for a season. And then we had to kind of start working out those patterns of self-defense that he had. And that's where the Sherpa, I think, came in. He was able to turn loose of his old memories, physical especially, but obviously mental. And then off we go together. And then if I make a mistake or my balance is off or something, he's like, it's okay, I got you. Yeah. Or then sometimes he gets lost and then I'm over here and he's like, whoa, I'm coming back to you. And that's a relationship. It's not a machine. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that's a really nice way of putting it. And, um, and, you know, one of the things too is that, you know, we always try to be so perfect in what we do with our horses. But when we recognize that we're going to make mistakes and that's part of our journey, it's part of our learning. And, you know, I think back on horses, I remember one that when I was in Kentucky and the mistakes that I made back then, because I just didn't know what I know now. Like you say, if we could go back with the wisdom that we have and go back to those horses. But the decision I made at the time was that I, I couldn't solve that in the past, but I could help every horse in the future that I come around. And so for me, it was right. learning from that and then gaining the knowledge I needed that would have solved that problem then and taking that forward with every horse that I work with so that I just keep helping the horses to make up for the one I couldn't help. That's right. Yep. It's almost like you had to go through that to be better for the ones after. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and speaking of really good horses, you have pictures behind you of a, one of the, I think, the most super horse on the planet. <laughs> you want to tell us about those pictures? Yes. yes. This picture right here is Secretary as a yearling. He's a yearling colt, and they probably didn't even know what they had. Mm -hmm. But this is a yearling colt here. It was taken in Paris, Kentucky. And of course, this is Secretary after his you know, after basically he's the Triple Crown winner and been to Canada, and this is a uh, a picture of Secretary in his in his uh, paddock when he was turned out to uh, to you know when he was in his breeding season, and uh, so uh, obviously we're horse people, and so to see the before and to see the after is a wonderful deal. And you can see he's I mean he's got his ears and he's just kind of hanging out and he's just a kid, but here we see the power and the majesty of a horse that. You know that was able to find his joy i mean talk about joy i mean you really can't if you're if you're a red-blooded breathing human being you really can't watch the belmont and see him pull away from those other horses he clearly had the meat but you, you you're whether you like racing or not doesn't matter but here's a horse that was in his element and loved what his do what loved what he did but in that particular moment that's probably to me one of the greatest moments in horse sport yes. when you saw him from his heart enjoy doing what he did and did it you know par excellence and i don't think anybody's duplicated that that moment you know ever since it's just you can't watch that without the hair standing up and, and recognizing that's something very special yeah and um on facebook that piece of film rolls around on a regular basis and i love watching that i you know, I went to see him when I lived in Kentucky. I went to see him at, um, um, on that ranch. And uh, mm -hmm. he, he was just an amazing, amazing horse. And he, and he so knew, he knew who he was, he knew what his job was, and he loved doing it. And that's the thing that that's was right. so amazing. He loved doing it. That's what we want for all of our horses, don't we? Yeah. 
Yep. yep. And, and sometimes, like you say, like, I'm, I'm going to pull up that um, picture of, of treasure again. Sometimes we just have to find the job they like to do the best. You know, like, um, sometimes we think we know what the job is. Oh, he's a little sweaty here, but that's okay. Then people can appreciate that you're in Kentucky. Um, <laughs> let me hang on. I get that, get that out of the way. Let me share that screen. Um, but it's, it's really important. I think that we do find the job that the horse is like. And if that, and if we're not interested in that job, then we find someone who likes that job and find, find a good home for that horse so that he's happy in what he's doing. Yeah, yeah, and you can tell even I'm real happy with him right there. I've kind of, you know, I've got that twinkle in my eye look. It's like, man, you really worked hard today, Treasure, and I'm real proud of you. Yeah, you can see the sweat around his eyes because yeah. Kentucky is hot in July. Um, but, you know, that he's willing to perform and to do, and, you know, who cares about the heat? That's, you know, my Al flags in the heat. He's just too a hot-bodied horse. I, <laughs> poor soul, he suffers. But this horse, he thrived. And that's what you can see in that picture. Yeah, the interesting thing about going to these, you know, and I'll occasionally take him out to a show if it's the right kind of show. They'll, this is real interesting, Wendy, and you'll get this. There'll be a lot of horses there, obviously, and it's not that I'm anything special. It's not me. But they'll see Treasure and I kind of over somewhere, just kind of playing with some simple things, getting ready for a class, warming up. And always there'll be some, and it's usually an old timer there'll usually be somebody walk up and like I said it's usually an old timer and they walk up and we don't always kind of fit the pattern that you see at a horse show mm -hmm. and there'll be somebody that walks up and they'll say I just wanted to come over and and tell you that I appreciate the relationship and the way you ride that horse and the relationship you have with that horse and I'm like I know what you're saying thank you that's better than any ribbon isn't it it is it is and it's been kind of a long process, so I appreciate, you know, the owners being uh, good enough sports to want what's best for their horse, just because yeah. we all do. Yeah, because it's it's hard sometimes, like if you have a, a new owner or an owner that's not uh, been around horses a lot, to tell them, look, it's going to take me three years to get your horse where you want it to be. Um, and to stick with the horse and you through that time um, and I think this is where some people get in trouble is that they have a horse that has some issues and they don't realize that in the process of undoing, the horses unravel just like people. And you've got to be able to go through those really sticky spots to get to the other side. You have to allow that to come out. You can't stuff it because if you stuff it, it's only going to get worse. You've got to let it come out and do that in a way that's safe for everyone but find a way where the horse can let go of the history, let go of the issues and, and come out on the other side. And sometimes that can take a lot of time. I'm sure you know about and that. I think, I think a key thing, Wendy, during that process, when the horse is kind of unraveling, I notice they all go through a season. Now, it's not on a certain timeline, but all of them will go through a, they'll kind of throw down almost like a, hey, I bet if I do this, you're going to correct me and get on to me just like before. And it's like, no. And it's almost like they'll test you to make sure that you're genuine. And the key thing I find right there is don't correct them the way you think you should correct them if they were like not re-asking the original question. If you can give them like a season of grace to let them kind of bring up those questions over and over and over again and you just say it's okay it's okay it's okay and and then pretty soon they start to think you know what it's okay he's not going to get on to me because i made a mistake and sometimes they'll do those things to see if they can trigger you because they want to know who you are and if you just stay the course stay steady and have a long-term vision of what you want for them they'll they'll learn to trust you and and especially during those windows of like when you say it's a little bit ugly or they're unraveling don't lose your cool uh don't lose your patience and just say you know what today is what i call a work day today is a work day and we're going to put you away at a good moment and then you're going to put in your stall and you get to soak on the fact that you had a nice quiet even though it was work you ended well you finished well for the day yeah and you know you um 
in the brain, and this is where I love listening to Dr. Peters, um, and I have to ask him this question, but I've, I've heard this term in other places. Um, it's called an extinction burst. And often what you'll see is an escalation of an old pattern before it actually is, extinguishes itself. It's like, it's like the nervous system has to do it one more time before it can let go. And so we see these mini uh, extinction bursts where they're not, they're not doing it to us and they're not doing it intentionally. It's that the habit patterns running in the brain are running on a circuit and it has to go through that process and have a different response. So nerves that fire together wire together and nerves that fire apart wire apart. And so when they do an action, we have to not do the corresponding action to unwire it. And that's what you're talking about is you're gonna, you're gonna act that, okay, fine. I'm just gonna keep myself safe, but I'm not gonna engage that. I'm not gonna correct you because if I do, I'm reinforcing the pattern you're expecting. And when I don't, I actually provide the nervous system with a way of letting it go to unwire it. Um, it's why so often when riders, I work with riders and I change their leg position, I have them use a stick or a whip to replace their leg so that they don't keep reinforcing the old habit of the leg. And once that pattern lets go, then I can show them another way, but I can't show them another way until we undo the old pattern. And the only way to do that is to stop using it. Um, and so I, you know, but it's hard sometimes with horses because the old pattern can appear threatening or can seem dangerous. And it's just really important in those moments that we make sure we're safe, but we don't interact, we don't engage it. Um, it takes a lot of self-control, I think. Um, and as you say, patience, a lot of patience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the self-control to override your instincts and just, just yeah. discipline yourself to just sit quiet, tell them it's going to be okay with all of your aids and, and just kind of ride through. In other words, you're filling in for them at that moment. Yeah. And then once they understand that you're going to fill in for them, I, I like that you provided the science behind it because I didn't quite, I didn't quite understand it all myself. I had just ridden through it enough that I knew that's how I worked. So it's interesting to hear the science behind it. Thank you. Yeah. There's a great book about um, habits, um, which I, I can't think of the title right now, but I'll, I'll text you the title. Um, because it talks about how do we break habits and essentially when a horse is behaving badly, it's become a habit. Like it's an, like, I think I relate it to chain smoking. You know, when a horse is anxious and they're constantly biting the lead shank or biting the chain or biting you, it's become a habit and they don't even know they're picking up the cigarette over and over and over. And to just yell at them is like, you know, yelling at a person to stop smoking. It doesn't work. Um, and we have to address the reason why the habit's there and then avoid the habit, like avoid picking up the cigarette, avoid the chain, and I just try to keep it out of their way as an example, until these other things can happen that the horse actually doesn't need to do it anymore. Um, but to just correct the horse for doing a habit that they don't know they're doing is just like, you know, yelling at your spouse for smoking when you know that they, they can't, they don't even know they're picking up a cigarette, right? It's, it's crazy making. Right. That's that's really good. That's that's another principle that I use, but I didn't have the science behind it because people will come in and they'll see one of my horses doing some little old thing that's not perfect, and they're like, "Aren't you going to fix that?" It's like, "No, I'm going to ignore it." Yes, because I've got bigger fish to fry that are important. And next thing you know, by ignoring it, those little things that I could have made like a big thing, they're just gone. Yeah, because the big thing horse is like hooking on to the big good things, and those little things they just disappear by not picking on them. Right, right. And so often what people don't understand is that the, that what the horse is expressing is either is not feeling safe or not feeling secure. And when we can make them feel safe and secure, then the anxiety patterns, just like in people, go away. You know, but safety and security is so critical to the horse being able to be present, to learn, to feel connection. It's all the stuff we've talked about with uh, in other webinars talking about the vagal nerve response and the number one question is, am I safe? And if we don't answer that, yes, you are safe with me. If we don't answer that in a positive way, that horse can never actually perform for us in the way we want because we failed the fundamental question of you are safe. Wow, this is great. I think I got more out of this than anybody today. <laughs>
Uh, yeah, I'll put the title of the book when we post the uh, webinar. I'll, it's um, I can see the cover. It's a yellow cover with wheels on it, and it's about habits. But I can't remember the name right now, so I'll, I'll make sure I post that later. Because it's you know the more we can understand the the neurochemical process behind a pattern, then the easier it is for us to look at something and go, oh. I, you know, I recognize that what you're actually showing me is your anxiety or, you know, you're not feeling comfortable or you're not feeling safe rather than just reacting to the symptom of that. And I think the horses that get in trouble the most, there's two of them. There's the shutdown horse, the horse that's totally non-reactive and then we wind up beating on it. And the fool around horse, the one that's messing around and fidgeting and not standing still. And we think he's just being badly behaved. But uh, Robin Hood's coined a really good phrase. Robin Hood is Linda's sister, Linda Tellington Jones' sister. And she calls it, uh, she calls fooling around domesticated flight. So the horse can't flee. So where does that energy go? It's got to go somewhere else. And so it goes into messing around. And if you think about kids, like I'll never forget in high school, the kid that put the ink down my back on my yellow shirt, you know, he was messing around. And the bottom line is he wasn't okay. But what happens is those kids and those horses get beat up on or yelled at or punished because they're misbehaving and the cause is missed and the cause is that they're not okay. And if we can address that, like you say, ignore the, the niggly things going on here and address the root, like feeling safe, helping them feel safe and secure, then those things go away on their own. Well, that's, that's good. That's good. I like it. Yeah. Somebody <laughs> said in the chat, Lester, that Lester is a treasure. <laughs> oh, well, thank you, Wendy, and thank you, thank you for your panel. I appreciate that. Well, it, uh, it kind of started out as a big old hunk of coal, and it's been polished by the fire, so. <laughs> you know that coal turns into diamonds, right? I do know that, yes. Yeah, so, so there's our treasure. Yep. Well, thank you, Lester. The sure, hour has sure. flown by. It's been a pleasure to have you as a guest. And I, I really appreciate you sharing our, your story of treasure. And it's just wonderful to see how, you know, the success story there and the lovely pictures of the horse and how, um, how you guys have found harmony. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. You're welcome, Wendy. Glad to be part of your program. Hello to everybody that's watching. Yep. All right, and so you can find this in all my webinars on my YouTube channel, Surefoot Equine. Please also go and join fans of Surefoot because we post success stories there and people can ask questions and share experiences. And um, I just wanna thank you all again for joining me. Um, tomorrow, my best is Ge Becky, uh, uh, I, Becky. <laughs> and she's gonna talk about Masterson Method. And so please join us tomorrow for another great webinar with another fabulous guest. Until then, Everybody take care and be safe. Thank you so much for joining okay. me. And, uh, bye, Lester. Bye. Yeah, bye, Wendy. From See y'all.